Welcome back to Arsenal. We are doing a tour of the Sherman 5C, commonly known as the Firefly. Now I'm gonna set a level of expectation first. This is the best Firefly that I could find to do a tour of, but it is not complete. However, we should still be able to get an idea of how much room in this turret was set aside for the gun and how much room was set aside for the crew. So they're not being very much on the outside of the turret except for the mounting point of the commander's machine gun. I've come on down, closed the turret doors, and you can see what the commander has to look out of. And it's basically, there would be one periscope here, rotatable, adjustable in elevation, and because the cupola would swing around, you could bring it to the front. This is quite miserable, but it was the standard Sherman hatch uh, in the early design. Uh, fortunately, the British, and also the Americans eventually, they developed vision cupolas. And the vision cupola had periscopes all the way around, which was a substantial improvement. A number of fireflies were equipped with it, obviously not this one. Uh, controls, he has a commander's override, which uh, uh, again, this vehicle was disassembled for testing for other purposes, so we're dealing with what's left. Uh, commander's override, of course, would allow him to lay the gun onto target much faster without having to direct the gunner uh, yelling at him over the intercom to figure out where he's going. To the rear, you can see that they have cut out, uh, and this is actually a pretty good job, rear wall of the turret. Now, uh, Bob, uh, Fletcher's book says that the one in Bobbington is roughly cut, so maybe they had an early one or something, but uh, back here would be the number 19 wireless set, and it was moved out of the way not because so much you're worried about the recoil of the gun hitting the radio, because it's highly unlikely, uh, but just so it would be a lot safer to, uh, to access all the controls just in case the gun did go off. And uh, of course also there's the additional counterweight issue that I mentioned. In terms of space, well you can see I'm already pretty cramped down, but I'm tall, that's not too unusual. Uh, the gunner seat is a little bit close to the TC's, and a lot of my real estate is taken up by the very large breech recoil guard uh, to my left. So you should be able to see hopefully a little bit of that. So before we go on to the next two seats, the gunner and the loader, since it is going to be the focus of their jobs, now is as good a time as any to talk about the 17 pounder. Uh, it was well known for being serviceably accurate and quite powerful. Uh, the catch is that it wasn't really designed to fit into a tank, let alone fit into a tank designed to have a medium velocity 75. It is commonly viewed that in order to get it to fit, they had to rotate it 90 degrees and then stick it in the turret. And this is a gross oversimplification. Uh, the first problem was that in the towed mount, the runout was about 40 inches. And there is not 40 inches of recoil space inside this turret. Uh, they had to change this down to a mere 10 or so. To do this, they took the recoil mechanism from the six pounder basically, and they upscaled that design. So you have recoil cylinders on opposite sides of the gun, uh, one up and right and the other low and left. The next thing they had to do was they had to shorten the cradle in order to get the thing to fit into the turret. This meant that you had less support on the gun. Uh, that then meant that they had to reshape the gun tube in order to have a similar amount of contact support as the ground mount had. Then they had to change the breech to operate horizontally. But it was a complete redesign because you still had the operators who want to open and close the thing and otherwise do maintenance. Well, they have not been rotated 90 degrees. Once you have all these changes made, you now have the Ordnance Quick Firing 17 pounder Mark IV, which is a basic tank cannon. The one in here is a Mark VII, and the main difference on this was the delay in breech opening. Uh, the Mark IVs, when you fired the round, especially a high, a high power round, uh, you had a lot of flashback from un unburned propellant. And uh, they have a video running on the background here at the museum, and it's, a, it's an old Firefly crewman say, so you could always tell the Firefly guys on parade, because they're the ones with no eyebrows and no hair below the beret line. Anyway, so that about tells you the backstory, and uh, let's move forward quickly to the gunner's position. So in the gunner's seat, I'm uh, gonna have to ask your indulgence and a little bit of uh, creative disbelief. 
This traverse system is supposed to be up here, but it weighs more than I can lift these angles at my height. So uh, just use uh, a little bit of thought there. Maybe, maybe our CG artists, we'll see. Uh, the British very much liked the oil gear power traverse system. So any Sherman which was converted to a C model, if they didn't have an oil gear system, they had one installed. Uh, it provided very fine uh, ability to adjust on the lay. They, they did like it a lot. However, uh, I wish I could say kind of the same about the rest of the configuration. Uh, there is a manual uh, traverse, which would have gone here. There is a power traverse right in the center. And you will see that unlike the standard American one, where that is the middle, and then you would go right and you go left, this is angled off a little bit so that the center position is off to the left. So that is full right and that is full left. The reason they did that is the ungodly position of the elevation handle. And this is only manual elevation. The, the gun itself was reasonably well balanced. It was balanced for an empty, uh, empty chamber. Uh, but allow me to demonstrate how you reach down to the elevation handle. I am now holding said handle and my head will go here at the side. I am at absolute full extension, and there is a horizontal bar which limits my ability to go up. The recoil guard limits my ability to go back, and I actually would find it kind of difficult to get any sort of leverage if I'm looking through the, uh, the periscope at the top right. Now, how easy it was to perform in duress. I mean, I guess adrenaline gives you a little bit of uh, help. Uh, certainly in the American trials, they did not like the position and I can understand why. The stabilization system is being completely removed, which I guess at least frees up a little bit of space, but it also means that you've lost the ability to fire on the move if you wish to do so. The CFT's primary sight, which would be here, would be in number 43. It is a by three optic, 13 degrees field of vision and graduated with two range scales. The one on the left was the main gun, APC and HE on the same scale, graduated up to 4,000 yards, which is a bit odd considering it had different muzzle velocities. One was about 3150 and the other one uh, 2,900 feet per second. On the right-hand side would be a machine gun scale. Your alternate sight was the original one that came with the tank, the 75 millimeter sight inside the M4 periscope with M38 telescope. Because this was the original site, they had to install a conversion chart on the turret wall that basically said, okay, if you are aiming with APC on a 17 pounder, this is where you have to aim on the periscope. So for example, 2000 yard actual target, you use a 3000 yard aiming point. Fortunately, most of the fighting was done at really short range and the 500 yard mark was right in the middle of the aiming circle. So you didn't have to think about it very much, just slow on the target and same center mass, you'd be good. August of 1944, a new round is deployed to the troops, a super velocity discarding Sabo. Now the catch was that they did not deploy new reticles for the guns. So you're supposed to take whatever the range was, divide by two, and that was the super elevation on the APC scale that you would apply. Now one of the big problems with the SVDS round was that uh, ranges where there was any notable deviation between the trajectory of APC divided by two and the SVDS round, you're looking at an exercise of the purest optimism to begin with. Uh, the British figured maybe 500 yards was the outer limit of range. The Americans just found it completely unacceptable in post-war testing. Worse, if you fired a couple of rounds of SVDS, you end up with some duralluminum fouling, and that would destroy the accuracy of the follow-on rounds. Not that the Firefly really needed the SVDS though. I mean, for, okay, yeah, everybody talks about it and how it's got a wonderful nine inches of penetration against a 30 degree steel target at the muzzle. But in practice, there wasn't exactly a heck of a lot that the regular APC round couldn't beat about a bit if it encountered it on the battlefield. For the process of target engagement, an infantry rangefinder was issued on the basis of one for every troop. Uh, the command would be something like, uh, Gunner, Traverse left, steady on, 1-800 Hornet. Uh, the British manual seems to imply that there are code names for all sorts of targets. So an ant is a transport, etc. So I would assume a Hornet is something that stings, like maybe a tank. I strongly suspect, however, that in the field, these code names went out the window and they simply reverted to using plain English and keeping it simpler. Once you have the range, you then engage. 
And this brings us to the next problem, and I'm going to quote something off the manual that I've transcribed here. The fundamental difficulty with 17-pounder shooting lies in observation. Muzzle flash, blast, dust, fumes, and the repercussion of vehicle as the gun fires make observation difficult. It is almost impossible to observe the tracer at ranges of less than 800 yards. The crew, especially the gunner and commander, must be trained to close their eyes at the instant of firing. Now, it also mentions that the TC needs to brace himself to hold the binoculars on target and suggests the use of a flank observer to see whether or not you're hitting anything. Another option it suggests is to fire a couple of ranging rounds with HE on the basis that the burst at the other end is going to be very easy to see and you can tell whether or not you're on target. To actually fire, he's got foot triggers. One on the left, one on the right for the coaxial and the main gun. Initially it was reversed, but they figured that was confusing since the gun is on the right and the coax is on the left. I think I've wrapped it on enough about the uh, gunner's position, so I'm going to hop over to the loader now. So the loader side. Now, just to put this thing into perspective. In 1942, US Army Ordnance approved for production the M4 76mm. That was an attempt to stick the 76mm into this small 75mm turret. Ordnance were happy. Uh, after it was ordered, an uh, armored force grabbed hold of a couple. And they said, look, it's fine for you to declare it works, but you don't have to use the damn thing. And as a result, uh, they, they canned the whole project, sent ordnance back to the drawing board, and it took them an extra year to get the 76mm really sorted. Now, the reason I bring this up is that the 76mm is somewhere around half the weight of the 17-pounder and is a somewhat smaller gun. And if Armored Force thought that was too big to be practicable, uh, one must wonder about the perspective of the British. Now, the first problem that they had with the larger breach was even getting into the Lotus place in the first place. Now, you will recall for the M4, I was not exactly complimentary about the fact that some designer decided not to put a loader's hatch in the turret, and it would appear that the British felt more or less the same way. They came to the same conclusion, uh, especially motivated by the fact that they have an even bigger breach to work around. And that conclusion was, let's give the loader a hatch. Good idea. So they cut out this square hatch here, they gave it a spring-loaded assist to help the loader open it up, and life became much better. Uh, another option would be that if you remove the rest of the recoil guard, such as has been done here, the commander's side will hinge up and out of the way, and you can get around the back that way. So for the sake of an experiment, I'm going to beg your indulgence. I'd like you to imagine, please, that there's a little bit more inside this tank than you can see. So for example, you'd have the bomb thrower here. It looks like a big pistol. You've seen it in other videos with maybe a little bit of extra ammunition on the side, your periscope, okay. The Browning 1919 coaxial machine gun with the spare ammunition stowed here on the left. And of course, his ready rack of five rounds, which are stowed uh, on the side. That's all the ammunition that is relatively available to him, plus, of course, the one in the tube. And the last piece of imagination I'd like you to use is that this is a 17-pounder round. This is actually smaller than a 17-pounder round. It's a couple of centimeters shorter, and it is definitely narrower. Uh, but it's the best we can find. If you're curious, we grabbed it out of the Stratzwagen 74. So you would take somehow manhandle the round out of the ready rack, bring it back into the bustle of the turret, that will clear the nose of the round to go in towards the breech. And hopefully the gun isn't too high of an elevation and it can actually do this. Uh, you then would have the recoil guard around here, so you've got to be careful avoiding that. And then bringing the round forward, twisting it sideways a little bit to straighten it up, and then into the tube you can go. Rate of fire was not particularly high uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, of course, the manhandling. Second problem was the obscuration problem, so you couldn't really fire again until you're able to see again. And the third problem was, with only five reloads available, you were going to run out of the appropriate type very quickly. So let's say you have three AP and two HG rounds, you fire off your two HE rounds and then you're stuck looking around for your long-term stowage. 77 rounds were available in the vehicle. In addition to the five in the ready rack, there was another 18 forward under the turret, uh, kind of backing in the driver. 40 more would be carried on the right-hand side under the turret, and they're relatively inaccessible. 
And the final 14 were in the former bow gunners position. Although it was possible to pull most of them out straight from the bow gunners position back into the loaders position with the turret spun around, it was usually easier to simply climb out and lift them up through the hatch and then down into the turret roof. This is the price you pay for putting a very powerful gun into a really small turret. Uh, but if that was a good idea, well, we can debate that a little later. So that done, let's go forward to the driver's position. Now, I've always been very comfortable in American tank driver's positions, and the M44 is no exception. I'm sitting on a very comfortable seat, which of course will elevate sufficiently to allow me to drive open hatch, foot on the clutch, lots of room on the accelerator, grab the steering tillers, no issues in the world. To the right, the gear lever is easily accessible. I'm not gonna bash my arms into anything as I use it. Can't complain at all. The transmission is big, it's not in the way. The panel you would expect with an engine as complex as the A57 actually isn't. Uh, in fact, about the only indicator that there is something a little bit strange is you have a slew of exhaust stack temperature warnings, five of them for the five exhausts that are coming out. Everything else is pretty much what you would expect standard, one oil pressure gauge, one temperature gauge, so on and so forth. Now, this tank was used for a while after the 1950s for the S-Tank trials, and it was being used to test whether or not they could steer correctly. Looking at the driver's position, you don't see anything. In fact, in the old tank, the only real giveaway is the weld marks for the I-beam that they had used for the, I guess, to represent the gun. Those weld marks are still on the front slope of the tank, but that's it. This is. Uh, pretty much the original driver's configuration as you would expect it. They've even left the builder's plate here, so according to this, it's uh, M4A4 number 176733, if any grognards want to look that one up. As we look aft, we do see that they've cut away part of the turret basket to make room for the 17-pounders elevation gear. And of course, being a small hatch, you know, it's Good news, it's directly above you and spring-loaded, so pop and out you go. You see, you can do quite quickly in a hurry if you have to. The bad news is it's a bit narrow and it's kind of tough to get out of, especially if you're worried about hurting yourself or ripping something. However, I shall do it now. Use the small hatch and then we can go on to debate the merits of the conversion. So that's it, our second Sherman. About 2,000 fireflies were built. They were distributed amongst the various Commonwealth countries. Now, onto the effectiveness. Now, it is said that the Germans were told to shoot at these things first. The British went to great lengths to try to conceal the extra length of the gun. Now, I haven't seen any documentary evidence to say that the Germans actually had such an instruction, and I have my doubts as to whether or not any German would have actually done so and ignored a tank that was an immediate threat. Still, the Firefly loss rates were less than those of other tanks. And it could be because of the camouflage, or it could simply be because the British hoarded them a little bit to the rear to be used as a sort of a reserve against any tanks which showed up. Indeed, in Italy, the Fireflies were taken as a separate troop, and their job as a troop, or platoon in American terms, would be to cover the rest of the company. Now, your opinion on Firefly is probably gonna depend on a couple of different factors. And, well, frankly, no opinion is necessarily gonna be wrong on this one because it's all a matter of perspective. Now, your first question is, do you want a tank or do you want a tank killer? This was a tank killer. As a general purpose tank, it suffered a couple of problems. Your second question is, well, do you want something that's okay now? or do you want to wait and get something which is excellent later? And again, this brings you to the difference between the 17-pounder Sherman and the 76 Sherman. 17-pounder on D-Day was present. The 76 was not. And although I would argue that the 76 was overall a better vehicle than Firefly, it was during those critical periods of time in Normandy that the Firefly established its reputation. 
So anyway, we're going to go back to looking at a few more Swedish tanks in the next episodes. So we'll see you there. <laughs>